first of all, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, welcome to the first of our series. Uh, this is the first of four panels that we're going to have on critical zone related stuff. And um, we've had a ton of people sign up. We're really excited. I think uh, some of you are even in classrooms, which we're really thrilled about. And, um, and I think there's a hardcore contingent from Beijing that's on right now at two in the morning. So um, anyway, welcome to all of you for being here. Um, so uh, to give you uh, just a heads up about these next four panels, what you'll see today and what we'll have for the next three weeks, um, we've been funded by the National Science Foundation um, to include, um, to think about inclusivity in the critical zone uh, network. And so our goal for these cyber seminars or these panels you'll see on Quasi are, are a few things. Um, one is to introduce concepts in critical zone science. So this is this integrated disciplinary, multidisciplinary space between earth and environmental science that we'll talk more about today. Um, and also share with our audience different ways that you can be involved um, in this, this really cool, exciting area. Um, and we have different um, foci for undergrads and grad students, postdocs, early career faculty, etc. And we'd like to connect you guys and be able to ask, uh, have you ask questions and have us try to answer some of those um, as well. And part of what we'd like to do with this workshop is inspire the next generation of inclusive leadership. And this image here on the right is um, sort of six signature traits of inclusive leaders. And we would like the critical zone community to, to, to lead in that, in that sort of idea. So just as a header to, to many of you, I don't know what the backgrounds are of everyone here, but this idea of critical zone science is the integrated earth and environmental sciences that look at everything from atmosphere all the way down to the base of bedrock. Um, and this includes a whole bunch of integrated um, disciplinary sciences, uh, geology and hydrology, ecology, atmospheric science. Um, chemistry, soil science, climate, et cetera, wireless sensor network. So there's a bunch of exciting things that fall within this critical zone network. And in order to solve some of these problems that feed back on one another, we need people with diverse skill sets and thoughts um, in order to move forward because the problems are not just complicated, but they're complex. So um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we were funded by the National Science Foundation to try to build community within the critical zone network. So we would like you to become um, a critical zone scientist if it's of interest to you. And some of the things that we're trying to do as part of our research coordination network is to promote approaches to quantifying uh, systems uh, within the critical zone, look at interactions between things like chemistry and biology and physics, and to think about how the critical zone is changing under what some call the Anthropocene acceleration. So we know that we're changing our climate. We have huge land use changes happening right now. What does that mean for this little piece of the earth that sustains most of life as we know it? And, um, and also to determine what matters at what scale. If we're thinking about things at really small scales versus really big scales, um, the processes that, that matter are probably quite different. And so our goal is to try to diversify our community to answer some of these questions. So um, one of the, the things we want to do besides providing opportunities to people is to build networks. And it's pretty hard to build a network on a, a cyber seminar. So what we're hoping through these cyber seminars is to provide opportunities that we can share with you all um, and then help build networks through a, a workshop that we'll be holding at uh, the Colorado School of Mines in June. Um, so this is a, um, a workshop that's, that's focused on early career researchers. So undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, early career faculty, people that have never worked in the critical zone before. Um, we'd like to invite you to Scenic Golden in June. Um, and this is a workshop that's funded by the National Science Foundation. So there is no registration free fee. That's all been covered. Um, we'll be able to cover your housing and your food while you're there for this three-day workshop. And we have travel support um, for the early career folks that apply. We can have up to 80 people there. So we hope you apply. Um, if you are more senior faculty, um, please encourage your students and postdocs to apply. Um, and we're especially looking for people from underrepresented groups to, to participate. And we mean that in the broadest of sense from first generation college students to people that identify within the LGBTQ community to uh, veterans to um, gender, ethnic, racial minorities, the whole the whole um, spectrum of, of folks, we'd love to have you be a part. So there's a web link there um, to our website. There's an application at the bottom and we're looking to have those applications in by April 1 so we can give people enough time to buy tickets. So with that in mind, uh, today uh, you have a super exciting panel of amazing people that I'm excited to have talk with you. They're, they only get two slides to, um, to share with you. And one is on um, a an interesting piece of the critical zone that they want to share with you around measurements. So how we actually make measurements in this little piece of the earth, um, this, this little skin from atmosphere to groundwater. 
Um, and then one slide they're going to share in a way that you can also participate. So if this is something of interest to you, what are some opportunities to get involved? So today's panel um, is going to have six folks uh, who I'll introduce as they come come through again, but we'll see Jordan Hayes from uh, Dickinson College, Jill Marshall from the University of Arkansas, Adam Ward from Indiana University, Diana, uh, Daniela Rempe from the University of Texas at Austin, Alexis Navarre Sichler from the Colorado School of Mines, and Jennifer McIntosh from the University of Arizona. Nikki West is also here on line with me as uh, the other facilitator. She's going to be helping to manage the Q&A uh, at the end of the, um, the planned talking part of this panel. So with no further ado, I'm going to um, turn this over to Jordan Hayes. Great. Um, welcome. I'm excited to be here and to talk to you really briefly about my research and to welcome all of you that are new to critical zone science. Um, so what I'm really interested in is the deep critical zone. And I know we've already seen this conceptual figure before, um, but just to kind of talk about what do I mean by the deep critical zone, I really mean the zone underneath the very, the very surface, the stuff that's inaccessible other than um, drilling or some kind of deep trenching process. And I'm interested in, in how this, this deep critical zone structure varies across the landscape. So this kind of offers, this conceptual figure offers a 1D view with depth, but if we actually explore a hill slope, explore a landscape, we see that there's, there's variations in that deep structure. And this, this, um, these conceptual figures over here, these hypotheses, I don't have time to go through them in, in great detail individually, except to say that there's, there's a variety of mechanisms that promote different patterns in that subsurface architecture. And if you want to learn more about that, I'd encourage you to check out this paper um, by Cliff Reby. So there's a variety of physical and chemical and biological process that, that's going to inform what that structure looks like, along with what inherited geology, inherited material properties are going to inform that structure. And that structure is really, really important. It matters for a number of reasons. Um, because it, it controls how and where water flows in the subsurface, and it controls how much water that subsurface can store as well. And as that rock at depth weathers and transforms to soil at the surface, it also liberates nutrients in those rocks that can be accessed by biota like trees and, and microbes. So, so the deep critical zone, there's these important feedbacks between the, sub, the surface and the deep subsurface that help make um, the deep critical, or help make the critical zone a habitable substrate for life. So how do I actually measure this? Um, I'm interested in using near surface geophysics, which is a, a, a non-invasive or minimally invasive way to kind of image or map out material properties in the subsurface. Um, there's a variety of near surface geophysical methods. Um, I, I use seismic refraction quite often, and that's what you're seeing in this first uh, image up here. So this is like a profile, a slice into the, into the critical zone, mapping out how um, seismic wave speed, how seismic energy travels, how fast that travels in the subsurface, and that's what the colors represent. And if you just look here, you know, a real quick look, you can see in this colorful fuzzy image, there's a lot of lateral variation in that structure um, across this hill slope. But we don't just stop there. We're interested in, in transforming those colorful fuzzy images into something that's more tangible and more usable by the broader critical zone audience. So we use methods like rock physics models to, to translate seismic velocity into a, a measure that's more useful like porosity. So porosity is, is key for a number of reasons and we're, we're curious about how porosity actually forms through these different weathering mechanisms. Um, and, and I think an important note here is that is, is how interdisciplinary critical zone science is. And so um, it's important to, to kind of incorporate and talk to other disciplines and, and be a, a transdisciplinary scientist. So in this study, we also incorporated 
geophysical or geochemical measurements. And, and those were really surprising and exciting because those geochemical measurements reveal that the porosity, the generation of the porosity isn't dominated by chemical mechanisms, which is kind of the conventional assumption for how, how porosity forms in the critical zone, but rather that the, these measurements reveal that physical processes really, really matter in, in developing this deep critical zone architecture. So one step even further, we, we combine these geochemical measurements and these geophysical measurements together to map out this, this metric of weathering, which is volumetric strain or how much the rock has expanded apart. And, and now we, we can look across the landscape and see how there's variable weathering taking place. Um, what's exciting about this is we see parts here that where the rock has, the volumetric strain is 100% or, or more, where the rock has actually doubled its volume as, it, as it's transforming um, coming towards the surface. So if you want to find out more about that, I encourage you to check out the, um, our paper in Science Advances that was published last year. So if you want to know how you can get involved, if, if you're curious about geophysics, if you know nothing or have a little experience, um, or you have ideas on how to collaborate with measurements that you already make and incorporate geophysics, please send me an email or you can also find me on social media. And for um, undergraduates who are, who are listening in or any of, any of you who interact with undergraduates, I'd encourage you to check out our, our newly named GNOMES project. Um, uh, we're, we're submitting a, a proposal to continue this on. Um, this is a near surface geophysics field experience for those that have basically no geophysical knowledge or, 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 or um, uh, experience prior. So mostly uh, first year and sophomore kind of student level um, who are just curious to find out more about near surface geophysics in the context of the critical zone. Um, so please advertise, promote that. If you want to know more about it, you can, um, you can Google uh, Geopaz near surface geophysics field experience and, and come up with a website. There's also a link here for a promo video. And Christina Keating, who is the lead PI in this project, will be discussing it in a future seminar series in this, in this seminar series. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, as Jordan is handing over the I don't know, the magic wand or whatever we have, I would like to introduce uh, Jill Marshall from the University of Arkansas, who will take it from here. My name is Jill Marshall, and I want to uh, second what Jordan said about I welcome everyone, uh, new to Critical Zone, Critical Zone Curious, all of that. And I'm going to talk briefly mainly about the measurements, not so much about the results. Um, on my work, moving from Jordan's work, where she's exploring the deep critical zone, and I'm working in the nearest surface. And what I'm really interested in is trying to understand what turns rock into soil. What are the physical mechanisms that damage and detach rock? Because soil is so much of what we depend on. And we have conceptual models and forested settings that center on trees. And in, in general, they're pretty much centered on things like tree throws, so trees falling over and detaching rock. But we really haven't been able, that's just based on empirical evidence when you walk and you see trees with rock in the roots. But until I started this project a couple years ago as part of my postdoc, no one had actually measured the forces that roots exert on rock. So that leads to the very first question, which is what are the mechanisms? What are all the different ways that trees might be able to physically damage and detach rock? And this builds on the work that Jordan and others are doing. What role do fractures and fracture density and rock strength play in the root driven water weakening? As Jordan mentioned, um, the critical zone is really important for holding water. And so root driven water weakening of rock and the generation of mobile material or soil. And then as Kamri alluded to, um, we are suffering from climate change and wholesale anthropogenic land conversion. And so it's important to try and quantify how the mechanisms and frequency or magnitude of if trees really can damage and attach rock, does that vary with species or forest structure, climate, aspect, the direction you're facing on a hill slope. So I set out to try and measure this. And I started out with these little tiny force sensors. So you'll see on the upper left, there is a pencil for scale, and that's the force sensor. It is really tiny. And um, it measures anywhere from about a pound force, or about 0.01 kilonewtons, to about 4.4 kilonewtons, or 1,000 pounds. So I cut away 
a tiny, tiny bit of the rock. You can see here, here is the rock, here's the root, here's the sensor. I cut away a little tiny bit of it, I insert the sensor, and then I backfill it with epoxy, which is about the same uh, material properties as the rock. And then we measure forces at really high resolution, at a uh, second to minute, depending upon what we're measuring. But of course, we want to know what might be causing. So it turns out these force sensors are really great for recording the frequency of signals. They're really not so great for recording the magnitudes. So we have a giant need for people who are doing work in engineering or sensor development. But we want to know, we want to be able to correlate the forces that we're seeing with the Forces. And so I've got anemometers at the base of tr the trees. We know that different species respond differently to the wind. They sway differently. But most of the work that's been done is looking more at the upper part of the trees. And I'm interested in how does energy transmit below the ground. So we have accelerometers that we can look to see when the wind blows, what's happening at the base of the tree. And that means, of course, we need to measure the wind. So we've got anemometers at the top of the trees or in groves right near the trees that I'm measuring. So when I started this project a couple years ago, we started with these force sensors to measure tree forces. We added in the accelerometers for tree sway, the anemometers for wind, then we measure a whole bunch of environmental variables, including things like shortwave radiation, which is a trigger for the roots to send water to the top of the trees. So we'd hypothesize that perhaps just the daily shrinking and swelling of roots as they take in water and send it to the treetops, that perhaps that put in part a very small load, but a cyclic load that was enough to damage the rock. And then indeed it looks like they do and it is. And then similar to that, we're measuring precipitation because we wanna know how much does root plumping matter? But it turns out that's not really enough because all of this, what it gets me is I can measure forces and I can measure things that correspond with the forces, but I still don't know when the rock's actually cracking. So I teamed up with Missy Epps. She's at this place called the Red Lair Observatory, North Carolina. And what we've done is we've added on a whole new suite of sensors. And my favorites, you can see them, they're these little, they're about they're the size of your thumbnail. Um, they're acoustic emission sensors and they're like mini seismometers. And so they can hear over a meter radius at, we can, at uh, multi-hertz frequency, we can, calculate the number of times the rock is cracking and we have enough of these sensors we can locate in 3D where it's happening in the rock. And so we combine that with thermocouples to get at rock temperature and all the stuff I was talking about and we're beginning to be able to tease apart how do trees amplify or maybe just all by themselves um, rock cracking. And of course, this is a new field. Uh, um, it's a part of critical zone science, but there's all sorts of ideas I'm looking for. So please feel free to reach out for me to me on this. And then in terms of opportunities to get involved with critical zone science, or get even more involved if you're partially involved, um, besides the fabulous workshop that Comedy mentioned that's coming up in June, there's I would Second, what Kamini said about workshops, small workshops are just the best way to have conversations with people. So here's a couple suggestions. I'm an earth scientist, so these are earth science focused, but the systems meeting in Boulder, which has funding for early career researchers to travel to, uh, and that often is associated with other groups. So, uh, you know, learn from lots of different people, Chapman and Gordon conferences, conference field trips. Those are such a fabulous place to talk off science with people you don't know. And I would encourage um, if you're from other countries or if you are early career, don't be afraid to apply for funding. It's just amazing to me how many workshops and conferences support early career researchers and welcome folks from unexpected disciplines. But of course, not everyone can travel to distant field observatories or difficult field locations. So I, one reason I talked about my, the work with Missy is that there are a lot of local observatories. You don't have to focus on the big giant critical zone observatories uh, or the new critical zone thematic network observatories that will be out there. I would suggest looking online for at local universities for people who identify as critical zone scientists. And often they have set up um, small observatories where there's many disciplines working together. It's a great way to get your feet wet. And then there's a, 
course, the Critical Zone Exploratory Network. I have the web address there. They often they have a list of sites and um, researchers. And then importantly, if you have a physical disability, uh, there's a group called IAGD, the International Association of Geoscience Diversity, which can help facilitate either remote visits or getting a, grants for equipment so you and working with researchers on sites so these can become accessible to you. And then finally, um, there's a lot of skill sets are needed. So uh, you're meeting us at our set of skill sets, but I think there's a giant unexplored world out there of people who can participate in critical zone science. Um, we're sadly lacking lots of rock mechanicians, in my opinion, uh, engineers, people who are doing big data, you might have some ideas. So. That's it, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, so uh, Jill will hand off now to Adam Ward, who is coming from Indiana University. Hey, everybody. So Adam Ward here. Um, I've been working in the Intensively Managed Landscapes CZO, um, sort of based out of Iowa and Illinois. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you can see a picture that doesn't look like most people's critical zones. Uh, instead, ours well, there is rock, but it's way, way down there in most of our landscape. Uh, and that beautiful developed soil column uh, is exceedingly rare. Um, our landscape is characterized, in fact, by what we humans have done. Um, so the things that get me super jazzed about critical zone science, uh, well, one, the fact that you've got this really complicated system where you're not just studying nutrient cycles, but you're studying them as they're coupled to all of these other systems. Um, we have scales that span from pores to atmospheres, so, you know, 12 or more orders of magnitude, depending on how you want to tally it. Uh, we've got geologic time scales and sub, you know, sub-second time scales of interaction. Um, and I just find it fascinating that we're trying to finally bring all of these concepts together. Um, you've seen folks here talk about a couple of specific measurement techniques, so I thought I'd go to the other extreme, which is, if you want to do that, you need a lot. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is absolutely not everything that we've measured in our critical zone observatory. This is a subset of it. Um, but when you start to ask, well, what does it take to understand this complicated, multidisciplinary, multi-scale, variable in time and space system? Uh, this is the sort of matrix that you put together of what to measure, when, and how to measure it. Um, so the thing that I wanted to just point out today is that if if you like being in the field, if you like the building of new equipment, the tinkering, the bringing together of data streams that other people don't try to analyze together, uh, the critical zone science community might be a home for you. Um, some of the ways that you might get involved here. Um, so broadly as a community, um, I wanted to try to highlight a few. Um, Quasi, who is generously helping host this uh, meeting today, um, has a number of fellowships that are available both to undergraduates and graduate students. Um, and in particular in the measurement theme here, the Instrumentation Discovery Travel Grants, uh, these actually fund you to hop on an airplane and go work with an expert to learn how their technique or their equipment works. So are you jazzed about rock stress at this point? Put in and you can get a thousand bucks to go, uh, you know, to go down to Arkansas and work on, or North Carolina and work on this stuff, right? Um, and Pathfinders let people work across different sites. Hydroinformatics let us understand how to take these disparate data streams and synthesize them. Um, of course, if you're thinking about graduate school, there are fellowships. Um, I put the NSF GRFP there, but uh, Department of Energy and USDA also have their own programs. Um, there's a host of different community experiments out there, which I think are really fascinating to help us get at spatial variation. Um, Wonders is a project that the Department of Energy runs. Um, they mail you a kit and with about four hours of one person's time, you can get state of the science data about organic carbon at your site. Um, CellDEX was a cellular decomposition experiment, which broadly means we're gonna, I think we put some cotton strips out, uh, we let them decompose for a while and then we stretch them to pull them apart and learn about how the microbial community degrades things. Um, there's a few different efforts uh, out of Europe, a thousand plastic rivers and 1,000 intermittent rivers that are similarly simple protocols that you can execute at your site and contribute to this global database. That also gets you access to that global database to learn about your own science questions. So there's neat community opportunities. And then on a super selfish level, uh, if the things I'm talking about resonate, 
Um, there's a few things that you might consider. Um, so each summer, um, at least for the next three, um, I'm able to host a handful of students out at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest um, for eco-informatics fellowships. So taking things like, um, oh, neural networks is one that we often hear about, sort of other informatics approaches to combine the data that come back from our samples and our sensors. Um, we've got a bit of funding to send you equipment in the mail if you're interested in doing a stream tracer experiment. So things like discharge or dispersion in a stream or how long water spends uh, in a place that I'm interested in. Um, we can help you remotely on that. Um, we do a bit of low cost sensor development around here. So we've, one of my students just invented a, basically an $80 sensor that replaces one we've been buying for 8,000. Um, and that, that, and really the, the NSF funded opens group that I forgot to link to here um, are making science accessible because it no longer requires that multi-thousand dollar instrument to collect good data. And so I think that's gonna really democratize what we do and let us collect data we've never seen before. Um, and absolutely, if you want to talk more about any of these things, um, or if you're just an early career person saying, how do you crack into this area? Um, my contact info is on the screen, and I am always happy to talk to people and uh, geek out about stream tracers in particular, but all things critical zone more broadly. All right, that's what I got. Thanks, all. Thanks a lot, Adam. Uh, next up, we'll have Daniela Rumpy from the University of Texas. So with respect to uh, measurements in the critical zone, well, I share a lot of scientific interests with my uh, fellow panelists here, so I won't um, belabor that. But um, my main research focus right now is on trying to improve how we document the dynamics of water storage, like how much water and the composition of water and gases in this kind of fractured bedrock layer that I've pictured here. Um, so it's the part of the critical zone that's you know above the water table but below soils that we're increasingly recognizing is really important um, to understand atmospheric processes. And a great review paper that came out last year by Yingfen Reinfelder, if you're interested in getting in this, um, into this area of coupling between the critical zone and the atmosphere, um, it really nicely describes kind of the outstanding challenges. And so um, one facet of my uh, research that I wanted to share with you is about um, kind of geophysical tools that we've been using to try to document water storage. And, um, and so it's kind of what I'm passionate about um, is advancing these techniques to try to get at the information at the scales um, that are relevant to understanding the role of this deeper fractured bedrock layer um, uh, to atmospheric processes. And so, um, for example, from the large scale, I've been using um, a superconducting gravity meter, not something that everybody has access to necessarily, um, <laughs> to try to understand sub millimeter uh, scale water storage changes over the scale of like many, many hill slopes. Um, and then from a much, much smaller scale, I've been trying to use a borehole nuclear magnetic resonance or surf surface nuclear magnetic resonance um, to try to tease apart how this magnetization decay signal from NMR um, tells us about not just how much water there is, but how that water is distributed in the pore network. And the reason that that's important to us is that um, we'd like to be able to partition the water that's stored there between water that can be taken up by plants and water that ends up in groundwater reservoirs or in our, in our streams for um, runoff. And so that's kind of the focus of, of my research right now, particularly regarding measuring the critical zone. Uh, and then I wanted to, um, I guess, highlight some opportunities that have been uh, really critical in my um, research development. Uh, and then uh, encourage others to look into them. Um, the Summer of Applied Geophysical Experience, SAGE, uh, is available to folks at, um, at early, early stages in their career, including assistant professors, I think. Um, and so that is similar to what Jordan described earlier, pretty, um, you know, you don't need a super intense background uh, in geophysics, but it can expose you to lots of near surface geophysical methods. Um, same with IRIS internship programs, I put those up here. Um, I, I've been personally very, uh, I guess, influenced by the field trips and workshops that I've done through um, organizations like GSA and Soil Science Society of America and SEG. And I would encourage Folks, just as Jill has, I'll echo what Jill said about asking for funding to attend, asking organizers for funding, um, not just to attend, but also for accessibility. Many field trips um, that are planned, I mean, they're planned by scientists like us that are speaking to you today, and they're um, 
um, and they can change their schedules, they can change the routes, they can change the sites based on accessibility needs. So I highly encourage folks who um, may need accommodations to, um, to not just assume that a field trip um, is not going to be accessible and to just inquire. Um, and sorry to put the burden on you to do that. Um, hopefully things will um, be more accessible in the future. And so the last resource I wanted to share with everyone is something that's out of the University of Texas. Um, right now, you know, it's really for UT students, but it's a resource we're putting online called the Geoscience Empowerment Network. And the idea is to have geoscience specific resources for folks that are looking into um, research in the geosciences, applying to grad schools, applying to assistant professor positions, um, recognizing that the geosciences is, is um, uh, diverse in terms of the types of fields and how different fields uh, value different metrics. Um, and, so, and so that's the focus of that geoscience empowerment network that I wanted to share. And so yeah, with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, next up, we have Alexis Navar Sichler from the Colorado School of Mines. Thanks everyone for joining in today. Um, I'm a geochemist um, who works in near surface environments, um, trying to understand the processes that you know control rock weathering and solute sourcing um, as one part of the research that I do. So I just wanted to highlight one area of geochemistry research in the critical zone, and that's thinking about um, how solutes are produced in watersheds. Um, the signature of that is essentially water chemistry uh, that comes out of the watershed, either in a groundwater sense or in a surface water sense. Um, so I'm just highlighting one example here of um, a, a study that we did a few years ago out of Andrews Creek in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, we're interested in these high alpine environments because um, they're potentially sensitive to climate change um, in ways that other systems are not. Um, and could show um, changes associated with uh, future climate uh, faster than other larger watersheds that may be more buffered. Um, so what you see here is sort of a talus slope at the base of a glacier. Uh, the stream kind of runs down in the middle. And then we've um, taken water chemistry data that the USGS has collected over um, quite a long period of time and looked at um, both concentrations of solutes. So here's the concentration of silica in Andrews Creek and um, used the discharge data. So you can see in red the discharge curve for one water year in 2003 to calculate mass loading. And so we're looking at really the mass of solutes produced in the watershed and how they're exported. Uh, so in these systems, we see a very interesting hydrograph where you've got, you know, sort of low uh, flow over the winter where things are frozen and everything's covered in snow. And then we have a big snow melt pulse and then a return back to sort of base flow conditions in the winter. So the questions that we're asking in systems like this is how do controls on solute production change over time, both within one year. Uh, so in this middle graph here, if we look at concentration um, as a function of discharge on the upper plot, um, the black curves are sort of, or the black points are base flow up to peak uh, discharge over spring uh, melt, and then the red is on the tailing end or the, the as discharge wanes after um, peak flow. And so what we see is a little bit different behavior in base flow conditions than we do um, during spring melt. And so we're asking the question, what drives uh, that difference in behavior throughout one single year? And then we've looked at data over a number of years. So on the bottom, we've got data from 1998 um, up through 2013. And we sort of categorized years as either wet or dry. And so we're starting to think about, you know, solute production from year to year. Um, and how the hydrology of a system um, helps to control that solute production. Ultimately, what we want to do is to be able to predict these changes through time. And so not only do we want to understand them from past data, but we want to try to predict it through time. And so we use not just um, field data, like I've shown here, but experimental work um, in a lab to try to um, figure out how rocks weather. Um, so we've adapted uh, microfluidic techniques where we laser etch uh, channels into the tops of mineral surfaces. Um, whoops, I did not mean to change that just yet. Um, and so what you can see here, this is a, a plagioclase mineral where we've etched channels into the top of this. This is a, a pretty close up view of those channels. Uh, we seal the top of it and then we push fluid through it 
and we basically measure solute production in a system that's much, much smaller than a watershed, which allows us to have experimental control over the water chemistry, how fast the water moves, and then we can try to use all of this data that we've collected in watersheds, field data, what we learn about how rocks weather in the lab, and then we put them into models, numerical simulations, so reactive transport simulations. This is just an example um, below of a paper that we're working on um, where we can try to model uh, geochemical reactions in solute production um, at scales, um, something similar to a hill slope scale in a watershed. Um, so this is just one view of some of the geochemistry research that happens in the critical zone. There's obviously a lot more, um, but it's something that we're interested in and um, encompasses the research that we do in my group. Along those lines, I am going to use my second slide as a completely shameless plug for um, another NSF-funded RCN. Um, so myself and Jenny Druin and Kate Maher um, got this project funded, um, and we're really looking at incorporating uh, reactive transport um, modeling education and training um, into this project um, where we're trying to build a community of people who use reactive transport models uh, to understand not just critical zone science but other science but critical zone science is a big piece of that um, and one part of that is um, what we're calling the reactive transport model summer institute so there will be workshops at colorado school of mines starting in uh, 2021 um, where people will come and you know, go through um, basically training and education for the application of reactive transport models to your, your uh, research or your site. Um, and we're really coming at this um, from a perspective of focusing on the skills that you need to think like a modeler. So how do you um, take your conceptual model? How do you take what you know about your system? put it into a numerical simulation framework, and then take the results that you get from that framework and go back to your, new, your real system and try to you know, uh, use both of those perspectives to gain a better understanding of what's happening. Um, so that's one piece of it that I would encourage people to watch for, um, uh, watch for announcements of this, and I will certainly um, rely on um, you know, some of these uh, webinars and other workshops to help get the word out. We'll be sending out um, emails on this. Um, but another piece of it is that we're also going to um, try to develop educational approaches and materials that will be available online. So anybody who's teaching classes in geochemical modeling or reactive transport modeling can go to a website um, and, you know, grab some material to, to use in your classes. And then we're also going to have uh, sort of workshops and, and community building events at, um, at conferences, at scientific conferences. Um, so this is all coming online. This was just funded um, a couple of months ago. Um, I think, in fact, we just got the money to University of Illinois, so Jenny can start working. Um, and so this will, this will be rolling out uh, relatively soon. And that's all I've got. Thank you, Alexis. Yeah. Um, and this, uh, this makes me think, actually, there's been a lot of great opportunities that people have brought up on this panel, and I will make sure to um, put these onto the website, including um, the um, workshops that Alexis was just talking about and some of the opportunities that everyone else has brought up um, onto the website for our um, research coordination network, which is the same one where the application is um, for the, um, the workshop in June. So um, thanks for making me think about Alexis. Um, so last but not least, I would like to introduce um, Jen McIntosh from the University of Arizona. Hello. Okay. Hi, welcome. Kamani said, I'm Jen McIntosh. I'm a professor at U of A. I'm also a mom to two little kiddos with lots of field experience themselves. Um, my research interests in the critical zone in part span from being a PI of the Southwestern Critical Zone Observatory in the Santa Catalina Mountains outside of Tucson in the Jemez River Basin. Um, critical Zone Observatory in Northern New Mexico. I'm particularly interested in the bottom of the critical zone, which has a couple different definitions. Um, the one that speaks to me the most is thinking about the zone in which bedrock initially weathers and either chemically or physically, and you open up porosity, um, which then leads to storage of water and release of chemicals. I'm interested into what's happening at the bottom of the critical zone, particularly how it's connected to the Earth's surface and why it's important for society. So I thought today I'd just highlight briefly some of the research that's been done recently by three of our PhD students. 
the reason why the deep critical zone is important is that we know that water coming from the deep critical zone sustains stream flow, both in terms of quantity as well as the quality of that stream water. But we often use those chemical fluxes like Alexa showed to infer what's happening in the deep critical zone. And we often infer things like how water is routed through the deep critical zone, what kind of reactions between water and rock is releasing solutes and sustaining biology. And all of that is really by looking at stream water to infer, you know, kind of a black box of what's happening in the deep critical zone. And we don't know a lot about its structure and how it's functioning and how it might change over time as well as across spatial scales, like across hill slopes and how that deep critical zone might respond to say fluxes coming in from the surface of either water or dissolved gases or dissolved solutes, and then how it might be controlled by what we call the bottom up or the initial geology, um, how that might be shaping the structure and function of this deep critical zone. So some of the key measurements, since it's often out of sight and out of mind, are some of the geophysical measurements that several folks on the panel have already described. And we're able to illuminate the deep critical zone down to about 50 meters in different landscape positions from those geophysical measurements, as well as coupled to deep drilling, which is something that I'm particularly interested in, is a way to access the rock and the water that is at significant depths. We collect during that drilling process, continuous cores of rock and soil material that we can analyze in the laboratory for things like geochemistry, as well as microbiology. And once we've drilled these deep boreholes, we can install monitoring wells that allow us to sample the water and investigate how it changes over time, both the level of the water, its dynamics, as well as its chemistry, and how long it's been in the subsurface. Once we have better information about the deep critical zone, we can couple that to what we see at their surface through stream waters that might be sustained by water coming from the deep critical zone. And one thing that we've done, as well as many others, is to look at that stream water um, over, over time and looking at high resolution, particularly as the stream water changes, as Alexa showed during dry periods or during snow melt, um, we can look at, again, the change um, in water chemistry, the transit times and the quantity of that water to have a better understanding of its connection to the deep critical zone. So just an example of some of the findings that our graduate students have found in our critical zone observatory sites in the southwestern US. We find that the groundwater in the deep critical zone is primarily recharged by winter precipitation. We know that that water has resided in the deep critical zone on the scale of tens to thousands of years. And again, that that deep water is what's sustaining stream flow at the surface. We know that between the deep critical zone and the soil, there are what we call perched aquifers or shallow groundwater that seasonally drains and also contributes to stream flow. We know that um, particularly in the Southwest, we're in a mega drought. We've had drought conditions over the past 40 years and that that has led to decreases in precipitation, which then leads to decreases in stream flow with unknown consequences for what's happened to the deep critical zone. And finally, in some of our sites, they have a really complex geologic history, such as the Hamas River Basin Critical Zone Observatory in the Valle Caldera Preserve, which is a volcanic setting. And so some of the, the structure of the deep critical zone and those mineral weathering processes happened really early on after deposition, and some of that is happening more recently. And so I think it's important to try to disentangle kind of that early history and more modern weathering of the critical zone. So I just wanted to highlight that, you know, even though um, critical zone science, you know, has been happening for quite a while now, we're really just scratching the surface and that, that there's a lot of open questions to hopefully um, engage some of you in that. Particularly from our sites, open questions include things like what role does microbiology play in deep weathering processes and the release of solutes from this bedrock to the streams. 
and how are these high mountain elevation sites that we intensively study connected to aquifers downstream, which are people's water resource. And then finally, how are long-term geologic timescale processes connected to what we think of as more modern fluxes? So stream response to recent precipitation, for example. And finally, as several panelists have mentioned, you know, how is the critical zone changing in the Anthropocene or because of the climate crisis? You know, what impacts will that have on critical zone processes? So how can you get involved besides um, you know, developing your own research questions or jumping on some of those that I just highlighted? Um, there is these critical zone observatories that have been funded for the last 10 years. The funding ends this fall for those existing observatories. However, the National Science Foundation put, it on, put out a new call for what they're calling critical zone collaborative network grant proposals and folks have already submitted grants and they should be hearing by next fall if they've been funded. And so stay tuned in a fall 2020, we expect about eight to 10 new projects related to critical zone science will be funded by NSF and they're likely to have a strong engagement component and with multiple sites. So again, stay tuned and contact PIs once those proposals are funded um, to get engaged. The um, critical zone RCN workshops have already been highlighted and I really encourage you to attend those as folks have already um, communicated. Those are great opportunities to really network and learn about you know, cutting edge science. I wanted to mention for the early career faculty and postdocs that critical zone science um, proposals can be submitted to the, the basic um, programs within a NSF um, earth sciences, such as hydrologic sciences or geobiology and low temperature geochemistry, or for a larger, more interdisciplinary proposal, the FRESC program. Um, several critical zone focused proposals have been um, funded through those programs. And finally, um, speaking about the University of Arizona, I think this is true of other universities as well. You know, with the growth of critical zone science, there's really been a lot of hiring of early career researchers at universities. And at the U of A, we've got over 15 faculty doing critical zone science. I just wanted to highlight some of the departments to show you the different disciplines, but also the point um, and particularly undergraduate students that are interested in applying to places like the University of Arizona, you might look in our department, hydrology and atmospheric sciences, but we've got faculty in geosciences, environmental science, school of natural resources, and geography, all working on critical zone science. So I encourage you to contact those folks um, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any specific questions about either my group or the University of Arizona in general. Thank you. Well, this is great. I would like to thank our panel um, so much. We have a few minutes that I would love to open the floor for questions. Um, so the way we're going to do this is there's a Q&A box that folks should see and, um, and you can type out your questions. And then um, <laughs> what we'll do is we'll have uh, Nikki West, who's here, um, call out to our panel if it's not clear. I see there's one question that's also been answered already by text, but we'll have Nikki um, potentially ask that one too. But please, um, anything anything goes for this group of people. So anything they've talked about, feel free um, to ask a question about. Anything they haven't, feel free to ask a question about. And, um, and we'll open the floor to all of you. Thanks again. So if you can see in the Q&A, um, we had a question about whether or not folks are looking into um, the actual effects of fungal hyphae. And it looks like um, Jill Marshall provided one response, but um, if Jill would like to share her response with the entire group. Um, and then I think after she answers that, um, if anybody else is working with a team that is looking at, um, potentially looking at the effects of fungal hyphae, they wanna chime in, we can just do little hand raises. Um, so I'm speaking as a geomorphologist, so um, everyone forgive me, um, but I, uh, so the question was, uh, are people looking at it? And my answer was, yes, absolutely. I know myself and several researchers 
um, are looking at, so for people who aren't familiar with what the fungal hyphae are, they're the um, mycorrhizae, the microbial community that lives on the roots of trees and often have a symbiotic relationship with um, the trees themselves. They go out and they mine nutrients in the rock and they help transfer water to trees themselves. And my understanding of this is that it's a really hard thing to measure in the field. There's a disparity in between lab numbers for um, microbial community rock weathering, for example, um, and what people see in the field. There's a, we, there's a bit about it in a review paper from 2017, Brantley et al., which we can post. Um, but there's a huge group of people who've been looking at it in soil. So not I, as far as I know, the rock is more difficult, but um, there's a large research group that have been looking at it in soil and other people. Um, I know Danielle is familiar with this. Other people might have more information on it. It looks like Sharon Billings um, also said that there are several researchers using sequencing data to try to link the kind of um, fungi or fungi with specific geochemical processes. Um, and so this is certainly something that seems to be incorporated into individual research um, and certainly could be something as we start developing these questions and workshops in June, um, things that can be brought up because um, I think even within popular science um, productions, folks have been talking about the mycorrhizal fungi and the hyphae and the, what they do with transporting um, material. A more general question that I think has been coming up is um, numerous panelists have made references to the deep critical zone and looking at deep critical zone processes. Um, I am hoping, I'm going to start with Jordan because we haven't heard from her since the start of this, um, how you define the difference between the deep critical zone and um, what would be considered non-deep or shallow. Well, then I'll give you a classic geophysical <laughs> answer is it depends, right? <laughs> um, uh, so the question was, how do I define what's deep? And, um, you know, I think you'll find a variety. It, it's, that's a difficult question because there's so many feedbacks between what's definitely deep and maybe what's not. So um, it depends on the process that you're investigating, right? And, and where the connections are. I think that's the best answer I can give. Maybe somebody else can can chime in there. I think one example which gets back to measurement is that um, it seems like early on in critical zone science, a lot of research was done from what we could hand auger and that we would stop at the point of refusal. And what's happened over the last five plus years is that there's been deep drilling campaigns, which has allowed us to drill down, you know, tens of meters, in some cases up to 50 meters. And what we find is that there, you know, there's bulk weathering that may be happening relatively shallow. So in our sites down to 15 meters, yet there's continued weathering along bedrock fractured surfaces. So kind of like Jordan saying, it depends on what process you're talking about. Are you talking about bulk weathering or then seeing fracture weathering? Another example I wanted to point out is, is groundwater. So we know that water tables in some cases can be beneath what we call regolith or, you know, I think of it as more mobile bedrock conversion to soil. So the water table might be really down in the bedrock. And so if you want to understand the groundwater within the critical zone that's then, say, sustaining stream flow, you really have to go deeper than what previous studies have done from just hand augering. So both the geophysical methods allow us to look deeper and the deep drilling allows us to access the deeper critical zone. Thank you. Um, another question that's popped up, I'm going to hand this one to Adam actually because he talked a lot about informatics. Um, in you know, what you might think the best practice is uh, to share data and promote data-driven studies. Um, since so many different types of data sets are being collected, that may or may not be compatible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, one of the things that's been really 
I think exciting in that the critical zone community has been pushing is making sure that we have complete metadata, uh, meaning the data about your data, um, and finding common ways to describe that. Um, so for me and for the observatory that I've worked with, uh, this means that all of our data are ending up in a, uh, a couple of different platforms. We use Quasi's HydroShare platform. Um, we like that one because you can drag and drop basically any file type into there. Um, so it kind of operates like Dropbox, but our data are backed up off site with redundancy uh, and we can choose to make those data available. Um, so they're, they're discoverable. Uh, and I think that's, I guess that's one big part of it to me is, you know, by, by making our data discoverable, we enable other people in the community to answer questions that we might not have even known exists. Um, so from an operational standpoint, you know, good metadata and being willing to take the small amount of time that it is to document what you did, how, why, when, where, um, and make it shareable, I think is really important. So that's somewhat of a, a logistical answer. Um, the other side is how do you make sense of those data? Uh, and that is absolutely an emerging area of science. Um, so I saw a nice quote at AGU and I can't remember who showed it nor who said it. Um, so I'll just, I'll just screw the whole thing up. Um, something to the effect that uh, scientists have dramatically underestimated our ability to collect data and overestimated our ability to make sense of it. Um, and this was in the 70s as, uh, as sort of digital tools and you know, automated monitoring were coming online. And I think we're suffering even more right now. Um, so I wish I had a, a magic solution as to how we deal with our data. Um, but at present, my personal opinion is that the earth sciences are actually a little bit behind. Um, there are lots of disciplines who are working with all kinds of different data sets and using tools that are much more advanced than we are. And so there's a huge opportunity for this next generation of CZ scientists, um, not just to work across disciplines, but to push yourself and say, okay, this is what my advisor could do with the 10 measurements that she had. What can I now do with the 10,000 measurements that I was able to collect? What new tools are enabled? What new insights might you find? I could drone on all day, but I see people like uh, rolling their eyes at me now. So that means I better stop. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm going to paraphrase a question that was uh, posed to Alexa specifically, but I think it goes in line with making sense of the data that we're collecting. Um, and specifically, um, how, how we might upscale our laboratory experimental data with field data. So with your microfluid experiments, how, you know, what are, how are you overcoming the challenges of upscaling the insights that you're making from those um, and actually couple those with your with your field research. Yeah, um, I did type in an answer. So if anybody wants to see what I just <laughs> typed in, um, I was working on that. Um, but um, it is a really great question. And, um, you know, basically what we're trying to do is, you know, we want to develop conceptual models of how these systems operate, um, you know, at the field scale, that's really the data and the, and the response that we're interested in um, thinking about how critical zones operate is because, you know, we want to know how it happens in the real world. Um, we want to use models to be able to, you know, predict, say, how land use perturbations or climate change or um, even just changes in precipitation from year to year change what happens in the critical zone. Um, but those models have to be parameterized. Um, and we often use experiments to measure the parameters that we need to parameterize those models. And so uh, from a geochemist perspective, um, what we need are things like, you know, how fast do minerals weather, the kinetics or the rates of mineral weathering, um, that's an input into our model. Um, and we measure those in the lab. Um, the other really uh, nice thing about doing lab experiments is that we have full experimental control. <laughs> so we don't really have control over when a watershed gets rain or, you know, how fast snow melts. Um, but we can, you know, abstract that into the lab into a smaller scale um, and really focus in on the mechanisms that we think are controlling things um, and measure them, put them in the model, run the model, and then 
integrate that with our data that we collect and see if it matches. And if it doesn't, then we go back to the experiments and we go back to the model and we go back out to the field and then we go back. And um, that whole process is actually what the um, RTM, the Reactive Transport Modeling Summer Institute is going to try to figure out how to teach people um, to think in that way, to you know, integrate models and data together um, to really start to, to understand what's happening in your system. Um, I'm sensitive to the fact, sorry, that we are probably running out of time, but I think that I see that Daniela has already signed up to uh, respond to an open question. So maybe we can make this the last one. But um, with that in mind, I um, would love to have um, to keep these conversations going. Obviously, we have a panel again next week. Um, and we'll try to leave a bit more time now that we know exactly what we're doing on this end, but also mm -hmm. to feel free to contact any of us um, on this uh, on this panel with questions because we'd be more than happy to talk. So um, I'll hand it back to Nikki to maybe close out the party. Okay, so um, one last thing too to follow up on um, Alexis's statement about coupling data and models together. Um, that is another one of the foci of this RCN is to actually get both modelers and data gatherers together um, so that we can um, get the most value out of the data sets that exist already and also the data sets that are being planned. Um, so please keep in touch with us as a group um, if you have ideas on how to do this one way or the other. Um, so as far as the final question I think that we were talking about was, you know, I think some of us were surprised and interested in the idea that um, rock fracture and water stored in rock fracture could intersect with atmospheric processes. So we are hoping that maybe Daniela Rempe can make some clarifying statements about that because it's a, definitely an exciting um, new topic. Yeah, so um, I mean, I think we're just all together as a community, like globally recognizing that soil sampling is just, um, you know, as Jen mentioned, our ability to auger doesn't really dictate the ability of the subsurface to hold water. So, um, uh, so yeah, we're all kind of both in like the you know, carbon cycling community and in the hydrologic or hydrology water cycle community, recognizing that there is uh, there are resources in the in the rock, and in some cases these are the limiting resources. Um, and so, as we consider environmental change, uh, yeah, the the plants that are mediating the connection between the atmosphere and the rock are might be sensitive or maybe even more sensitive to these deeper sources of water and nutrients and, and their evolution and sensitivity to climate. So, I mean, that was, I guess, my the, the comment there. There's a lot of active research on this, but um, a lot more is needed. And I think the emphasis so far has been on places that are limited, water limited. And, um, and I think it's kind of emerging that it's not really, uh, or like these, the at least plant um, uh, reliance on water sources and nutrient sources in rock are not limited to, Places that are that are uh, arid or um, or have you know strongly seasonal climates, um, and so it's this kind of like a brand new, exciting new frontier to think about. Um, yeah, I don't know if that addresses. And I, I answered the question also, or I typed a little bit as well. Um, I wanted to say, I guess one thing. I know we're ending, um, but I think one of the things that I hope would come out of this is that you know we emphasize field camps in at least I'm in a geoscience department, and I know ecology departments emphasize field camp. And I know there are a lot of different efforts to train people in measurement techniques specific to critical zone science, and many more are coming out. And sometimes they're only short lived, like they only happen for a year or so. Um, but it'd be great if we could at least in our panel. Um, come up with a list of these uh, specifically critical zone science measurement technique training opportunities. Um, yeah, sorry, I took my platform. <laughs> to no, it's awesome. Speak on that. So with that, I know that we ran a little over. I thank you all for holding out until the very end. We really appreciate it. Um, for those of you that are interested, we'll be back at the same same bat time, same bat channel um, next week um, for the second the second coming of the RCN cyber panels, which will be about modeling the critical zone. Um, we'll stay on and finish uh, answers to any questions that anyone has here. But otherwise, thank you all so much. I very much appreciate you taking the time.